Good afternoon. My name is Laura Cutler. I'm the Managing Director of the Center for Israel Studies at American University. We're delighted to welcome so many people today from all over the world for what is clearly um, a very important conversation to many of you, the changing relationship between diaspora Jews and Israel. It is my delight to turn the meeting over to our moderator for today's discussion, Professor Michael Brenner, who is the director of the Center for Israel Studies at American University and the Seymour and Lillian Abenson Chair in Israel Studies at American University. He also holds the Chair of Jewish History and Culture at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. He is the author of many books translated into over 10 languages. Uh, his last book was In Search of Israel, The History of an Idea in 2018. But as is his habit, he is also already almost about to come out with his next book, which is called Hitler's Munich, Jews in Hitler's Munich, Jews, Anti-Semites, and the Rise of Nazism. So thank you all for joining us today. And Michael, the floor. Thank you, Laura. And welcome to everyone. I'm really excited to welcome such a large number of participants today who are joining us, thanks to our new virtual reality from America, Europe, and Israel. For those of you uh, not familiar yet with the Center for Israel Studies at American University, let me just tell you that we were actually the first such center established in the United States. The center was inaugurated by Shimon Peres in 1998, and we organize events basically on a weekly basis during the semester. A week from today, for example, we will be hosting an event in the memory of Yitzhak Rabin, 25 years after his assassination with his daughter Dalia, Ambassador Dennis Ross, and Ambassador Itamar Rabinovich. That's a week from today. If you've not yet joined our group of friends or want to learn more about our center, please contact us. It is my pleasure to briefly introduce our three panelists who certainly do not need long introduction. Delphine Orvieur is a French rabbi author of several essays and managing editor of Tenu's Review, of, of, sorry, of Tenu's Review. She worked as a journalist for the French television, serving notably in the Middle East office in Jerusalem. She then studied at the Hebrew Union College in New York, and there she was ordained as a rabbi. She is one of the founding members of Kerem, the Council of French-speaking liberal rabbis, and she works as a rabbi for Judaism Movement, a community affiliated with the World Union of Progressive Judaism. Isaac Herzog is chairman of the executive of the Jewish Agency for Israel. An attorney by profession, he had a long career in Israeli politics as member of Knesset, chairman of the Israeli Labor Party, Knesset opposition leader, and also having held several ministerial posts. Isaac Herzog stems from one of Israel's most prominent families. His grandfather was the first chief rabbi of Israel. His father was president of Israel. David Harris has led the AJC, the American Jewish Committee, since 1990. Described by the late Israeli president Shimon Peres as the foreign minister of the Jewish people, he has been invited to speak at some of the world's most prestigious forums. He's been honored more than 20 times, including by 13 countries for his international efforts in defense of human rights, advancement of the transatlantic partnership and dedication to the Jewish people. So welcome all of you in our virtual conversation here in Washington DC. When the state of Israel was established, less than 10% of the Jewish people lived in a Jewish state. Today, almost every second Jew lives in Israel. And even though there is a growing Israeli diaspora worldwide, if present trends continue, more than half of the Jewish population will soon be residing in Israel. And as we know, it's always been in Israel's interest 
to nurture Jewish life in the diaspora. As a latest attempt, let me quote, this July, the Israeli government issued what they called a comprehensive strategic framework for ensuring the continued existence and unity of the world Jewish community. The unity of the Jewish people, if it ever existed, seems today more at stake than ever. In recent years, we have seen political and religious changes that affect the relationship between the diaspora communities and Israel. So let me begin with a general question to all of you. How would you describe the general state of Israel diaspora affairs from your point of view today? And how did it change over the last two decades? So basically since the beginning of this century. And keep in mind that our time is limited and we want to include questions from our audience later. So um, keep your answers short and let me begin with this question, maybe with you, Chairman Herzog. Thank you very much, Professor Brenner. It's an honor to be here. I wanna thank you and the Center for Israel Studies at this, the very distinguished university. Thank you, Laura Cutler and the entire team, and especially my colleagues, Rabbi Delphine Orvillier, a great friend, and Mr. David Harris, another great friend. I'm sure it's gonna be a fascinating discussion. What brought me on board from politics to lead the, the, the biggest Jewish organization in the world, the Jewish Agency, was exactly this question. Namely, how do we keep our people united or how do we, let's uh, say, how do we prevent a historical irreversible split? I do identify two major Jewish communities who are the pillars right now of the Jewish world, although there are many, many all around the world. But let's say that Israel and North America are the two main pillars, each one around six and a half million Jews. I call it Jerusalem and Babylon. I say in, the, in ancient times, they produced two different Talmuds, but they did correspond with each other. And I say to today, despite the fact that Israel is very central to American Jewry, there are uh, cracks. And uh, there, is, there are quarters where uh, Israel is kind of fading away from the cent its centrality in, in those quarters. And they're looking for alternatives and, uh, and we must, make sure that there is no split. Now there are dark spots because of the different lifestyles of Judaism all over, but there are also very positive spots. There, are, there is a huge amount of interaction between uh, all, all parts of Judaism. Uh, in, in many places, they all convene together and you see all rabbis of, and all kippot and all groups uh, even in Israel, there are some changes which I'll be happy to elaborate further on of a very important nature. And uh, of course, there is the discussion of the average uh, Jewish person outside Israel about what he, he or she feels about Israel as such, namely its policies or what is the, uh, you know, how it's depicted uh, in his own community. These are major questions which also obliges the Israelis to know so much more about Jewish life abroad, something which we've put as a central pillar of our agenda. You're on mute. Right? Um, Thank you so much. Uh, let's, let's go to the other big center first and ask David Harris how, see, how he sees that. Michael, thank you. And I, I join with um, my good friend Isaac Herzog in thanking all of you the Center and American University uh, for hosting this event and for including me. It, it's a, a very large question, Michael, as you know, and I, I don't think I can do it justice um, in just uh, 280 characters or so. But um, I would say this, the American Jewish community today numbers, depending on who you believe, as many as 6.8 million Jews. Uh, it's impossible to categorize 6.8 million Jews monolithically. So in effect, you can find in today's American Jewish community, whatever thesis it is you're looking to present. Um, strong, resilient um, bonds, as, as, as Isaac Herzog said, absolutely. Um, incredibly strong, resilient bonds. Um, 
Attenuated bonds, you can find that as well. Alienated bonds, you can find that as well. What are the trends um, that affect this, this, this climate uh, and that at least it, from my perspective, need to focus on the first, the first group, which is ensuring that the core of American Jewry remains close to Israel and finds it not just politically important, but if you will, metaphysically important, metaphysically. Um, and here we're dealing with several trends. Number one, unlike Jews in Europe, for example, if I can generalize and I defer to Delphine, of course, um, American Jews have seen themselves historically as an exception to the Zionist belief that the diaspora would sort of wither and disappear with the reestablishment of sovereignty in, in Israel. Uh, we are geographically more distant than Europe. If one looks at surveys of American Jews and European Jews, far fewer American Jews have visited Israel. Far fewer American Jews today have close relatives and far fewer Jews feel Israel, not just in their head, but in their heart and in their soul. Number two, there's been in some important parts of American Jewry an attenuation of Jewish identity. This is a larger question, but as part of that attenuation of Jewish identity, um, less connection to Israel. After all, if one feels less Jewish, then why would one necessarily feel close to Israel uh, in the way that, that, that others might? Number three, I think for some American Jews, Michael, there's also been um, some difficulty in adjusting to the new reality. Uh, when, when American Jews were the kind of beneficent uncle, um, helping their poor brethren and cousins in sort of emerging Israel, uh, it was one thing. Israel today is a strong, powerful, successful nation with all of its daily challenges. Um, it's a huge success story. It's an amazing success story. And I think for American Jews, there's also a need to adjust to the reality that the Israel of today is a global powerhouse. Uh, and that creates a whole new set of realities about what it means to be connected to Israel. And I would just add, and again, Isaac Herzog and the Jewish Agency have been leaders in this field. It also requires a reminder and an education to Israelis of why the diaspora matters, why the diaspora um, is more than just a fundraising source or a cheerleading section, but why it's an integral part of, of the Jewish people and, and why this relationship continues to be not just important, but mutually important and mutually beneficial. Thank you, thank you, David. And uh, I'll turn to Europe now, to Rabbi Ovier and uh, Having grown up myself in Europe, I know how often Europe is in a way ignored as a Jewish center in terms of numbers that may be true, but in terms of tradition, I think Europe still plays a big role in our consciousness of Jewish, of the, what the Jewish world constitutes. But I turn to you and would like to ask you about the specific, uh, about your specific perspective of this question of Israeli Diaspora relations, how they have changed over the last two, two decades with respect to France and Europe. Yes. First of all, thank you for this invitation. I'm so happy to spend this time with you. Generally, I live in Paris, but uh, I'm talking to you now from Brussels. I'm giving a lecture tonight here in Brussels. And uh, actually, I'm teaching about, um, you know, we are starting again this week, the reading of uh, Parashat Bereshit, starting again the reading of the Torah from the very beginning and it's a very good time to think about um, starting again and what it means to be able to renew something in our life and it's particularly relevant to think about it in time of crisis as the one we are experiencing today you know in, in Hebrew the word mashber has something to do in the bible with um, a birthing stool like the ability to you know envision in a time of crisis how things could be 
different, could be renewed. And I think it's particularly relevant to our discussion. So I was um, lucky in the past uh, 20 years, actually exactly the, the time you're mentioning now, I was lucky in the past 20 years to live in France, in Israel and in America. So I had the experience of these uh, <laughs> three nations and the way they envision um, their identity, their contribution to the world and their Jewish contribution to the world. And actually, I think it's, it's quite striking because there is a, a common feature between these, two, these three countries is that each one of them somehow considers it has a kind of universal message to bring to the world. You know, like America brings this idea of like bringing freedom to the world and France considers it brings equality and the notion of equality to the world, like a, like a light unto the nation. And Israel also contributes uh, to this notion of like recreation and safety and security. And I think it's, it's very relevant for um, our discussion uh, actually that uh, um, we tend to perceive our place in the world and even our Jewish history as being somehow um, be, being made up too much of strength or of vulnerabilities. Um, and I think, it, for example, for my French Jew, Jewish experience, it's been particularly relevant in recent years when people f uh, think about the French Jewish experience, they tend to think only of its vulnerability, uh, of its lack of strength in a way. And I think it would be very interesting as a way to renew our relationships today and to strengthen our relationship to be able to feel how much each one of us is actually full of strength and weaknesses and so much vulnerable upon the other. You know, we are in time of sanitary crisis and it's a time that reminds to each one of us how much we are actually vulnerable and how much each one of us is in need of the other. And I think it could be a very powerful model today to rethink our diaspora Israeli relationships, to be able to put forward both our strengths and our vulnerabilities and our deep need for each other. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for these opening statements. And I want to go right into one of those cracks, which uh, Isaac Kurtzog mentioned before, um, let's keep the political out for a moment. Let's start with the religious question, which in a way divides, um, of course, large parts of the Jewish diaspora in Israel. As we all know, Israel, in Israel, only the Orthodox uh, are really recognized and have official functions and other denominations within Judaism have a second class position. At the same time in Israel, in, in, the, in America, um, most Jews belong either to the conservative or reform movements. So um, we know in the last few years, there were some committees and attempts to bridge the gap, uh, especially in Israel, but also among world Jewish leaders, um, attempts to introduce uh, more pluralistic prayers at the Western Wall, uh, attempts to broaden the recognition of non-Orthodox conversions, and maybe in general, to just broaden the recognition of non-Orthodox in Israel, non-Orthodox Jews in Israel. Um, let me maybe start in this case with the rabbi. Uh, rabbi Ovir, how do you see, um, having lived, of course, in all three places, how do you see um, this development? Do you have any suggestion how we can bridge this gap, which is visible for any person who affiliates with the religious uh, denomination? Well, in the past years, I was lucky to take part in many of these conversations, sometimes official, sometimes not official conversations between denominations. And what I learned from these intra-religious intra dialogues is that very often they are much more difficult than inter-religious dialogues. You know, it's much more difficult to dialogue inside the house than it is to dialogue between different faiths. But it all comes back to a very simple idea, which I could summarize in a very simple way. Is in, and it could be summarized this way. Are you willing in your world, in your religious world, to make room for otherness? And actually this question of intra-religious dialogue is, uh, is key, you know, uh, I would say even theologically. Are you willing to make room for 
other figures? Are you willing to make room for femininity, for women, for converted? Are you willing to make room for other families, for other models of behavior? Um, it's actually, you know, for me, it's a very philosophical and theological question. That's why I think it's so critical for Jewish leaders and for, Jew for the Jewish state today to be able to show and to really uh, to show a model of of, uh, of openness and again I was um, I was blessed to live in three different countries in the past 20 years and it's quite obvious that the situation is very very different in America than it is than it is today in Europe and uh, and uh, and in Israel uh, but I think um, the crisis we're going through is for me an opportunity to rethink more generally the will we're having to make room for others and to uh, define what could be a pluralistic model, including a religious pluralistic model. Yes, uh, thank you. And let's go to David Harris. So we just heard that it is, and I agree, very often easier, I'm sorry, very often harder to overcome the gaps within the house, within the family, than reaching out to other religions in that case. Um, I know the American Jewish community also has tried a lot to bridge it. Where do you think we are and what has really to be done next? Michael, let me, let me begin very personally, um, just to humanize, so just give a human face to the story. Um, my, my eldest son, married um, a beautiful Israeli girl. Um, they were married um, in Washington, DC. By the way, she was doing her LLM at American University. <laughs> so I can give a shout out to the sponsoring university uh, here. Uh, and they, they went to a judge's chamber and they received a civil marriage certificate and they were married. Um, but of course they wanted to be married in Israel, but they wanted to be married in Israel, if you will, honestly, consistent with their own beliefs. Uh, and so uh, they were married by, and Delphine may know him, Rabbi Azari, uh, Mayor Azari, who was a liberal rabbi uh, and uh, under a chuppah in Israel. Now the irony of the story, of course, and I'm sure many viewers know, is that their civil certificate in Washington, D.C. was recognized in Israel as the legal basis for their marriage. But their marriage under a chuppah uh, in Tel Aviv by Rabbi Azari, an Israeli citizen whose wife serves as Israel's ambassador to Poland, and I think soon to, to Russia, was not recognized. I, I mean, for me, uh, Yes, in this sense, I guess I, I'm, I'm, I'm positively infected by the American spirit of pluralism. Uh, I, I have always understood both in American society, but also in Jewish peoplehood, the recognition that we are, um, we are many on different paths, leading in the same direction with the same destiny. So I know that for many American Jews, Michael, uh, these issues of non-recognition, or if you will, partial or stunted recognition, um, are major obstacles to the fulfillment of their relationship with Israel. People like me are able to compartmentalize, meaning we're able to be upset about the issues you re referenced, the Kotel, um, uh, marriage, divorce, even questions about who is and who is not a rabbi, who, who can and who cannot oversee conversion. These issues have spilled over into the Israel-US relationship on many, many occasions. I'm able to compartmentalize because my love of Israel allows me to put it into a larger context. On the other hand, I fear that there are some American Jews for whom this cannot be easily compartmentalized. The basic view, and I'm simplifying being, if Israel is not willing to recognize me or my spouse or my rabbi as, a, as an authentic Jew, then why should, I, why should I 
devote my time and attention to Israel. Um, the last thing I would say is from my experience, and uh, I've also spent a lot of time, my family, Delphine is from France, my mother and my father, um, and I've also obviously spent a lot of time in Israel. Most Israelis, from my experience, agree with what Delphine said and, and what I'm saying. And yet when it comes to political behavior, voting behavior, this issue does not rise high enough in order to shape people's decisions on who to choose. Issues of economy and security and trust tend to overshadow. And I understand that. But I hope one day that that, that, that large and quiet center in Israel that agrees um, with this and that has concerns about the monopoly uh, by the chief rabbinate, a very different chief rabbinate than Isaac Herzog's grandfather, that, 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 that they will come to recognize that this is an impediment to the notion of Am Mechad, of one people, which I think is so central to Sachnut, worldview to the American Jewish Committee's worldview, and if I may say, to Delphine's worldview, to the extent that I know her. Okay, so... Uh, Thanks for sharing. Right. Yes, Isaac Herzog. So first of all, I, I want to go from the, from the, I, you know, the ideal situation to the facts on the ground, because I do not believe <clears throat> this issue will be resolved by a revolution. It can only be a change by evolution. First of all, I explain to everybody, it's not that Israel doesn't recognize each and every one of our brothers and sisters abroad. Israel actually does recognize, and each and every one of our viewers and any other uh, Jew uh, from, the, from all over the world can make Aliyah and become an Israeli citizen automatically disregarding his or her uh, congregation or denomination and uh, we, the Jewish agency, deal with it. We know it all the time. What, it, what, who, who doesn't recognize uh, the other streams, the reform and conservative, is the rabbanut, the chief rabbinate. But it doesn't mean that you cannot get married in Israel by other means, just as you mentioned. I know it's not the ideal way, but it's not that you're not recognized. You're recognized for all intents and purposes. You can't just hold a a, a marriage ceremony under the Rabbanut. Now that's a big difference of, of rhetoric because for many years this wasn't an issue. It evolved dramatically in the last 15 years, correctly so, because, and this is another important development, because of the substantial growth of reform and conservative congregations in Israel, way above what people understand or know and or other non-denominational congregations who are being built all around the country in a very interesting process. Thirdly, the big issue in my mind is the lack of dialogue and understanding and knowledge what various Jewish lifestyles and beliefs are all about, what denom these denominations are all about. The average Israeli was either secular or orthodox. He had no clue of either on the other side. He didn't know what Jewish life is abroad, never understood what reform or conservative life was. The reform movement went into Israel only in the 1960s, so it kind of leaped only behind. And this is an educational process. When today we have tens of thousands of Israeli emissaries, shlichim, of the Jewish agency who came back from living abroad in Jewish communities, they are the, the delivering a message of what it is pluralistic way of life. And there is a clear change in the perception of Israelis about what the content of Jewish life we would like to have. And as a signal of that, I can tell you that personally for the last two years in my capacity, I've been speaking to all religious leaders of the most polarized uh, positions and I find much more love of Israel between all streams than people understand. And this was also mentioned in various forums, including the cabinet of Israel, including by ultra-Orthodox leaders, that are the, the reform and conservative are our brothers and sisters, but we are 
and we have a we uh, we have an opinion about what should be the nature of the Jewish state. Now, recently there was actually a watershed event because whilst in a bro in America, rabbis of all denominations convene together in any forum and speak to each other with no uh, limitations. In Israel, it didn't happen yet. And this is a major issue, major stumbling block, major mental block in the discussion between the groups. Well, Delphine Ovilar was the first one to hold a dialogue with Rabbi Eliezer Melamed, who's a very, very famous and well-known rabbi of the Zionist religious Orthodox movement who uh, lives in the uh, Haubachai settlement in, in with the West Bank. And this was a very major dramatic event, which was depicted all over the religious press in Israel. And R Rabbi Melamed then went and published three more articles about saying why we have to have a dialogue with our reformed brothers and sisters, which was a major watershed and which definitely res rep uh, uh, reflects an undercurrent which should be encouraged in a, in a smart way, in a dialogue, less confrontation, but more of a dialogue. In my mind, there is a direction for change if we push forward for a dialogue. Yes, I wanna add it was a very indeed respectful dialogue and I was uh, very impressed by the level of communication we could have. Many people told me beforehand it wouldn't be possible. And I'm very grateful for the organizers of this dialogue. That was very but powerful. But Delphine, you agree with me that nobody in the Jewish world knows about it, meaning everybody likes the position of saying everything is doomsday, everything is irreversible, it's all tragic relationship. Well, guys, there is much more of a change in the, uh, what's going on in the field than people understand or are told about. Okay, I hope we will see the results on ground also very soon. Um, and, and I know you and your organizations, of course, are working towards it, uh, but not everybody uh, in Israel. And of course, every religious issue is also a political issue in Israel. Very explosive. Uh, so that is, of course, not a little bit on the way. So let me build a bridge now to the next question. And my last one for this round, then we go to the questions from the audience. Um, and I hope we will also uh, deepen this religious question a little bit in the audience. Obviously, there is also political divide. And now I think especially about American Jews and Israeli Jews. Let me put it that way. I would say if today the majority of uh, American Jews um, would elect, let's say there would be direct election, would elect the Prime Minister of Israel, they would probably elect a different prime minister of Israel uh, as Israeli Jews. If the majority of Israeli Jews would vote for the American president, they would probably vote very differently than the majority of American Jews. Um, now, this is a hypothetical question, but of course, uh, what it shows us is that there is a divide. I would put it, you know, very crudely, uh, that we have a majority of liberal, um, politically liberal Jews in America versus a more right-wing uh, voter, voters among the Jewish um, uh, public in Israel. And the question is also how to divide this gap, which I think we see increasingly when we talk about the diaspora, the American Jewish diaspora versus Israel. And we'll come to Europe in a minute, but let's maybe start with this. Uh, David, would you start with what I would say, you know, is despite all solidarity, something we all witness. Well, Michael, you're giving us um, a very big challenge, which is uh, extremely important questions and little time to respond. <laughs> so I apologize in advance for, for being uh, telegraphic, but, but, but I, I agree essentially with your assessment and again, allow me to generalize, understanding that every generalization is, is risky and problematic. But in America, to a large degree, American Jews have embraced sort of the philosophical notion of universalism. Uh, I'll, I'll call it in Jewish terms, tikkun olamism, as their religion. And if I'm right, 
that a, a large segment have embraced Tikkun Olamism, which is, essentially means a kind of universalism, then it leads them to, in one direction politically, which is largely in what might be termed a liberal, progressive direction. And if we look at, 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 at um, exit results from every American presidential election since 1932, with only one exception, in 1980, uh, American Jews have, in majority terms, always voted for the Democratic candidate. Um, as high as, I think, 88% in 1992, uh, but always certainly over the 50 to 60% mark, with the exception of Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter. And then if you ask more recently, Michael, a question which the American Jewish Committee does ask in many of our surveys of American Jews, how important are these are various issues to you in your decision how to vote? I'm sorry to say, from my perspective, that Israel uh, too often does not rank terribly high. So other issues, um, all very legitimate issues, uh, economic issues, social issues, environmental issues, um, uh, gender issues, tend to rate higher than Israel. So, and then if you add to it one more factor, Michael, which, which we see on many American campuses, perhaps on American universities campus, you would know better than I, but in many parts of America, Israel's detractors have succeeded in depicting Israel as an illiberal political cause. Meaning if today you stand up proudly for Israel politically, for the US-Israel relationship, you tend to be put together with the Republican party, with the evangelicals, with the so-called right wing. And what once upon a time was a very liberal cause, Israel in its early years, has now largely given way to this new narrative. So put it all together, universalism, Tikkun Olamism, liberalism, and a kind of declining um, connection to Israel for some, for a large chunk. I think this helps explain um, much of the divide, at least from the American Jewish perspective. And the last thing I would say, if I may, Michael, is um, I think, and here I speak analytically, I think for, for many American Jews as well, there's a very big difficulty in grasping what sovereignty means and how to factor sovereignty into their sense of Jewish identity. In other words, if I'm an American Jew living in New York City, as I am, and I go to a wonderful synagogue with an Argentine rabbi on Friday evening and lots of great music, and by the end of the evening, this is pre-COVID and I hope post-COVID, we're all swaying back and forth, arm in arm, um, uh, 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 singing together, chanting together. Um, it's, it, it, it's a wonderfully fulfilling and enriching form of Jewish identity. But how does one reconcile that form of Jewish identity, that expression, with another reality, which is Israel as a sovereign state cannot limit itself to those warm, wonderful expressions of sisterhood and brotherhood on Friday night. It has to deal with extraordinarily difficult, sometimes amoral decisions about statehood and sovereignty and national security because its, it, it's, it, its future has not yet been fully insured in its neighborhood. So this clash between, if you will, faith um, and sovereignty is also something which I think many American Jews have not fully understood, even as I dare say many Israelis continue to grapple with how does one balance the notion of or le goyim, being a light unto the nations with the nitty gritty reality that as a state, it must survive and make difficult decisions every day um, that are morally, ethically challenging decisions. Thank you, David. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, for the sake of brevity, let me let me uh, ask uh, Isaac Herzog, who was the leader of uh, once, of course, the strongest party in the country, the Labour Party, which today we don't even know if it would make it into the Knesset. Um, is there some basis, maybe, to what David just said, that more and more American Jews see Israel by the words of 
its prime minister, its, um, you know, some of the politics which are more right-wing, which are more embracing American evangelicals. Uh, is that maybe not so wrong or do we see this? So first of all, I agree with uh, David's comments. They were very smart and they depicted the whole, uh, part of the root causes of this uh, perception. Uh, we have to understand the following. We are in the midst. I mean, you're right uh, uh, on, in, on the verge of uh, the ballot boxes in America. So clearly the emotions will be as high as possible. And when they are high as possible, both camps uh, see only, uh, you know, uh, colors of black and white, nothing else, no gray. But the truth of the matter is that uh, in, uh, in the political world that we live in, which is a very rough, aggressive uh, world of politics, um, people tend to choose whilst the truth is that the love of Israel, Israel should be beyond any political argument. Meaning you, you have to accept the fact that Israel is a very vibrant political system. I, I, I challenged Netanyahu for premiership in 2015. I almost won. I know why I didn't win and I respect the Israeli voters decision. And it has to do a lot of it in the perception of war and peace and who brings to us more security. This is a very vital issue, which is not affecting American Jewish uh, population in general. On the other hand, in America, there is a major political uh, divide, major. It impacts the, the, the way people view who is with Trump and who is against Trump. And I've been telling every community I visited, please, go away and above Netanyahu and Trump because they are the immediate, but we have to look for the future. Then there are many other, other undercurrents which David touched upon. And these undercurrents have impact our, our being in universities and campuses. There's a whole effort to delegitimize the whole right of the Jews to have their own nation state. People do not understand the Israeli political system. When I tell opposers, on campus that we have a Muslim Brotherhood party in our parliament, people are awed. It's the only brother, Muslim Brotherhood party in the world which is legitimate because our democracy is as far as possible, but people don't get it because why would the New York Times report about it? And therefore I think people need to deliver the message of learning more, understanding more and understanding that the immediate does not count for the fact that Israel should say stay central in the heart of Jewish people. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, if you know your, <clears throat> sorry. Um, yeah. I also noticed that in Europe, of course, uh, there is an increasing trend of J many Jewish voters going to the right or sometimes even extreme right. And I don't know if you want to comment on this or how in general uh, the political Divide or not divide um, is, uh, how would you portray today between the French Jewish diaspora and Israel? Yeah, first of all, I want to react. I was um, now listening to the, the exchange and um, I'm going to put on my rabbinic hat for, for a second. You know, there's, in the Talmud, there's this uh, notion of kol Israel arevim zeleze, this idea that the entire people of Israel is kind of should be, should feel responsible for each other and should feel how much each one's fate is related to one another. And I think it, it's relevant for our discussion. Um, last time we met in Israel, Isaac, I don't know if you remember, um, we talked about it. Um, uh, actually in Bereshit, in the parasha of the week, there is this sentence that keeps coming back. You know, the world is created in Bereshit and the, the sentence that keeps coming back, the verse is, uh, etc., etc. It was evening and it was morning and a new day was coming. And it's interesting that in Hebrew, the word Erev has something to do with Arevut, like evening could be translated as responsibility. And Boker has something to do with Bikoret, which in Hebrew means uh, criticism or self-criticism. And I love this idea that a new world is created in Bereshit when you can say that there is responsibility for each other, common fate, but there is also ability to criticize or to be right. self-critical. And then there is a new 
day that can come. And I think we're exactly there, like in terms of the um, political criticism toward Israel or the diaspora has to come both with the recognition that we share our fate and are responsible for each other, but also that we should be able to handle criticism in, you know, in all time. And I think this is something that can be very meaningful for us all today. And you're right, in, in Europe and France also has to deal with, um, with these political tensions in recent years. I think French Jews mainly had to deal with the fact that uh, Zionism somehow um, around us in France and in Europe became a very dirty word. You know, people were not able anymore to know exactly what people mean when they say they're Zionist or anti-Zionist. You know, I remember, for example, myself so many times I had to stop a conversation with someone who told me he or she is anti-Zionist and I had to stop the conversation asking the person to say exactly you know, what do you mean when you say you're a Zionist or anti-Zionist? We don't know anymore what people uh, mean through this word. And, uh, but mainly, I think in Europe, the, the big discussion is probably around um, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. And um, how do we handle today anti-Semitism? Actually, maybe we'll, we'll reach that question now, but it's, it's a very critical moment to talk today about anti-Semitism. Yesterday in Paris, I don't know if you heard, the entire Rue de Rivoli, like the major street in the center of Paris, was covered with the uh, swastikas signs. And um, it's quite interesting, I don't know if interesting is the right word, that uh, in this time of sanitary crisis and coronavirus crisis, um, all these news around anti-Semitism in Europe seem to go, you know, undercover, underground. Suddenly we, we, we don't talk about it because it seems very secondary, uh, but we should really be aware today of what is going on. Thank, thank you. And, 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 and that reminds me actually of, um, you have written on this uh, perspective really from a long, <clears throat> long perspective on the, on the way of anti-Semitism today. Um, in, in, in your book. I don't even know, is it out in English also? It will be out in English. Uh, it should be out by early 2021. Ah, so okay. It's really hopefully. very profound and I, I can just recommend it. By the way, Delphine's books are best sellers in, in France. You should know that. And um, I would like now to turn to your question. We don't have that much time, but uh, I do uh, asked Laura Cutler, our managing director, to read maybe two or three questions, and I would ask you for brief answers to the question. Laura? Yes. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to combine three questions into one because they're getting at the same issue. A junior at American University, Lindsay Schwalson, asks, for any of the panelists, given that the government's been largely controlled by the right wing and religious bloc, and it does not seem to be changing anytime soon, do you see a future where there's a successful change in Israel to become more secular and welcoming to more um, denominations. Um, Norman Lipoff asks along the same lines, is there any signs of recognition by the ultra-religious political parties in Israel of pluralism? And I think um, the final one gets to something, uh, maybe there is an answer in this that um, Delphine was talking about earlier. What motivated the discussion, this is from Wendy Hall, between Rabbi Delphine and her ultra-Orthodox colleague from his perspective in particular? So what can we see as bringing together the Jewish world in Israel? So if I can answer briefly, first of all, in all nations, or nations are going through evolutions and processes. It's like asking, uh, we, you know, what will be in America, in the American political scene. And in 2013, you had a, a truly liberal government. Uh, the ultra-orthodox were not even there until 2013. So, I mean, because there are a contradictory extremes in Israel and a lot of evolutionary processes and a lot of questions on the agenda, the political system is built 
in a certain way. Right now, we have a national unity government after three elections where they, each bloc could not get a victory. What does that mean? It means the nation is split in the middle, okay? And this national unity government is 50-50, totally, uh, totally as we call it, paritetic and every decision must be taken mutually. Therefore, there will be no decision that will hurt uh, or prejudice uh, religious freedom in Israel. The question of uh, 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 the ultra-Orthodox establishment uh, versus the Rabbanut is one of the questions, but as David mentioned correctly, there are many other questions on the Israeli agenda, and uh, many things can change in the Israeli political and public scene. Uh, we, I won't bore you now, we don't have much time, but there are many, many changes all the time, all the time on many fronts, on many issues, including issues of the attitude towards the other, on many issues towards the other, and this is an evolution in, any, in society. I invite you post-COVID to all to come to Israel and learn so much more and understand so much more, but I do not agree that it's only a one-way street. By the way, in America, there is a major substantial growth by the ultra-Orthodox communities, and so much so that in a historical step, for the first time, an ultra-Orthodox uh, party participate in the Zionist elections and is playing a very substantial role in the building of the coalition in all of the Zionist institutions the JNF and the Sochnut and the World Zionist Organization and so forth. So that's another change and it comes from America. So we have to understand that the world is changing and nations are changing too. Yeah. You're on mute. I, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's a, in, actually, in, Isaac, you're bringing forth a very interesting also philosophical question. Uh, more generally, it's like, how does change occur? Does change happen from inside the system or does it come from a, a pressure outside the system? And I think it's, it, it can be both, you know, I'll give you a personal uh, testimony. I've been a rabbi in France for 12 years now. And for me, uh, everything changed when I'm, as you can imagine, the orthodox uh, institutions in France are not really fond of the idea of a female rabbi being a religious leader in France, but things changed for me when suddenly I published many books and I became more recognized by the public power and by the media. And somehow the fact that I gained recognition from society, generally speaking in France, forced somehow a recognition inside the Jewish community. So sometimes changes happens because the system is pressured from the outside and sometimes it happens from inside and to answer the question that was asked about my conversation with Rabbi Eliezer Melamed, it happened because we met in Jerusalem about a year ago in, in a meeting between different denominations and um, we had a very nice discussions and I think somehow it kept in memory this personal discussion we had and sometimes you know Sometimes the difference is made simple, simply by, you know, personal relation you build, like from inside the system. I don't know if, I, if what I'm trying to say now is clear, but I, I believe that change sometimes happens from external pressure. And sometimes it happens because simple, simply of an encounter, like a human meeting. So I, I, Michael, my, my, my answer to the, to the various questions is, um, uh, I, I don't think that there is an easy or obvious answer. I, I know that Americans in particular always like happy endings um, to stories. And I would like to suggest that there is a happy ending. And I'm Jewish enough to believe that we have to want to believe that change is possible. But I, I think, first of all, um, the issue of the place of the, call it the Haredi population in Israel, is not one that's going to be solved overnight. It's one that, from my perspective at least, poses one of the great societal challenges for Israel over the long term, especially given demographic trends. And that's why the efforts to bring further education, secular education, vocational education, 
uh, national service, military service becomes even more important looking ahead. Number two, for me, unlike for at least some American Jews, that's not a turnoff to moving away from Israel and saying, until Israel solves these issues, I have no interest in Israel. For me, Michael, it's an, it's an encouragement to become even more involved because uh, for those of us who approach this from the sense of Ahavat Yisrael, love of Israel, the notion of what a Jewish state means, we know what a democratic state means, I think, but what a Jewish and democratic state means is really, let's be honest with ourselves, up for grabs. That there is more than one way of defining what that Jewish state is and ought to be. So if it's in contention as it is, uh, those of us who care deeply about Israel, I think have, have to be uh, involved. And then I would just add two quick points. Number one, these issues are not limited, of course, to Israel. When my family and I lived in Geneva, Switzerland, a city that Isaac also knows well, uh, I, I, we attended a liberal synagogue. And then to our dismay, we discovered that the liberal congregation in Geneva and in Zurich at the time were not recognized by the umbrella body of Swiss Jewry. They were excluded. And even as we were talking at the time about growing anti-Semitism, growing anti-Zionism, here was this small community of Jews in Switzerland. And even within the community, there were the issues of non-recognition. And the last point is right now, as we speak in New York, we have a major COVID-19 crisis involving the uh, segments of the Haredi population in New York. It's, it's been very much in the news, very much in the news. And I think it underscores among other things, Michael, the very wide gap between the Haredi communities, at least some of them, and the rest of the Jewish community. So when people call me, for example, from the American Jewish Committee and say, do something, do something about what's going on, the desire is there, believe me. The impulse is there, but practically speaking, it's not clear what we can do because the bridges of communication, much less understanding, are very, very few. So we have our work cut out, but again, for, for us, for me, it's not a reason to walk away it's a reason to become even more involved. Thank you, and thank you all. I know you have commitments right now. Uh, Delphine is uh, you're giving a lecture, and Isaac has a meeting, and David, of course, is busy as well. So we do have to end it here. I know we, we only scratched the surface, barely scratched the surface. That's actually why our students come and take you know, semester-long classes so we can discuss these issues more in depth, and I, encourage, of course, all our students to take classes on Israel, which we offer. Um, but I think it gave us food for thought, for further thought, and this is to be continued. One, in one of the Q's and A, one person suggested, which I think is a good one, to continue this among students. Maybe, you know, we have Israeli students, we have uh, European Jewish students, and we have American Jewish students. That could be a nice way to um, bridge it to the next generation. But I want to thank you all. I also want to thank Laura Cutler for all the organizational help. Without it would have been impossible. And um, um, we will continue this discussion. We will hear much about it in the future. Uh, I want to thank you. I know your time is precious. I want to thank you very much for participating. Thank you all very much. Thank and, you. Uh, stay in touch. Good to be with you, Isaac and Delphine. Pleasure. Thank you, Michael Same and Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.